Hey, welcome back to our study. We're looking at Titus chapter 1, 10 through 16. We're looking at a study called The Enemies Within. And today we're looking at 13 and 14, the second half of 13. And uh, we're talking about what must be done. Now, we looked at last time who these people are in the church that are trying to get in the church, that are ins insubordinate, they're empty talkers, they're deceivers. Um, Paul quotes from Epimenides about how the Cretans were specifically liars and lazy gluttons and wild beasts. So he doesn't hold back from telling it how it is, right? Because he quotes from that guy and then says, yes, that testimony is true. That is exactly right. These Cretans are that way. So Titus, pay attention. So Paul doesn't hold back from sharp rebuke because it is well deserved. Those that are bent on destroying others must be severely dealt with. The shepherd does not gently ask the wolf to stop biting his sheep. You know, he doesn't, oh, look at that little wolf. Hey, Mr. Wolf, please, please, can you, do you mind not doing that? No, he rushes at it, yelling with his rod in his hand and the sling at the ready. And this Paul follows the example of Christ. He would sit and eat with those that needed to be instructed and helped to turn from sin. With others, he called them baby snakes and said that they were devil worshippers and whitewashed tombs. He not snuff out a smoldering wick, but also flipped over the money changers, that flipped over their tables, and chased them down with whips. Both reactions are necessary depending on the state of the person it's directed. The main objective for the sharp rebuke, then, is not to destroy, but to stop them from, as here in this case is to stop them from devoting themselves to Jewish myths and commands of people to turn away from the truth. So the goal of the sharp rebuke is the health of the person's faith. Some might say, well, you know, you, you shouldn't rebuke people because that's mean. Paul would say, no, the opposite is true. To not sharply rebuke in this, t in this situation, Titus would be the one that was evil. He would not only be supporting the false teacher's headlong run into hell, but would allow them to try and drag along as many uh, other people as they could. And that would thereby increase their guilt before God. So Titus ref refraining from rebuking would show that he has no regard for the false teacher, nor the congregation either. So he has to do this. He has to rebuke them. He cannot allow these false teachers to keep doing that, not just for those whom they might destroy through their false teaching, but for the false teachers themselves, they need to hear the fact that what you're saying is wrong. And what you're saying in the route you're heading down looks like you're heading for hell. And so you need to stop. You know, listen. Look at what you're doing. Pay attention to what's going on. And so Titus has to do this. And that carries over to the day, too. We have to rebuke false teachers. We have to rebuke false teaching. We have to correct those who contradict it. That's what it says. That's what elders are supposed to do. You know, and to a certain extent, all Christians must be party of that, too. But especially those who are leaders in the church, we have to correct those who contradict God's word, whether that's in the church or outside the church. We're always correcting those who contradict God's word. And so if we don't do it, sometimes we need to do it harshly. Sometimes we need to do it sharply, and sometimes, you know, gently, depending on who we're talking to. But there, there, it has to be done. It has to be done. So that's the end of our study today. Come back uh, tomorrow, and we'll look at verses 15 through 16, and we'll see what is the, what is the sentence? What is, what is Paul saying is, uh, you know, what are all these people all about? That's what we're going to look at. So come back next time.